In this video, we're gonna go into the key difference differences between residential and commercial financing. So here's the reason why you're going to want to tune into the very end of this video. I'm going to show you some actionable steps, some actual homework that you can get to take yourself to get yourself leveled up and networked with the perfect lender for your first commercial deal and your next one and your next one. Because this process is all about scaling and repeating from, let's say, a million dollar deal all the way up to a five, ten million dollar real estate portfolio that you're going to be able to learn the tactics that I use to scale my own portfolio. Plus, I'm going to show you how one of my clients put $131,000 into his pocket tax-free by using my custom continuous balance sheet optimization method and what he's doing with that cash, which might actually shock you. You may be completely lost when it comes to buying commercial income property, and that's okay. Financing, what is covered in this video is the most important element of what makes commercial far superior to residential. After watching this, you'll be armed with the intelligence that will make commercial lenders take you seriously and not as a noob. And also, after then, the homework I give you, you'll be able to confidently navigate the commercial lending space, get approved so you can accurately analyze commercial real estate deals, okay? This was an area where I struggled as a real estate investor graduating from residential to commercial. I did I was trying to apply it apply the same type of terminology and tactics that I used in residential that were not relevant to commercial at all. And it actually resulted in me wasting a lot of time with lenders that really just didn't take me seriously. Once you go from residential to commercial, you're dealing with different people, different types of mechanical processes and that sort of thing. So we're going to cover that in this video here. So I'm actually going to share my screen real quick. All right, so as we're going through this here, the we're gonna go through the product types, right? And what actually makes commercial different than residential, okay? The product type that you see right here is one through four family is considered residential, okay? Even if it's an investment property, even if it's owned in your, own, in your LLC name, okay? Commercial is what is five plus units, multifamily, or anything that has a type of commercial use. So if you have a mixed use building where you have a storefront and then two apartments up top, then that is actually a commercial deal and has different types of lenders that you're going to bring those types of deals to, whether it's on a purchase or a refinance. Another big thing, this is the game changer for me when it comes to the scalability of commercial real estate is the appraisal approach. approach. With residential, you are hamstrung by sales comparables, okay? So you, regardless of what you do to the property you buy, if it's two family, if you trick it out with the highest end finishes, with the, you know, granite countertops and the custom, you know, custom cabinets and all this stuff, you are going to be hamstrung by what your neighbor's house sold for down the street, all right? This is not a meritocracy. This is, you know... And I've made a lot of money utilizing the Burr method with residential, but you know I used to give myself a pat on the back if I was able to push the value of a property by fifty thousand dollars over twelve months. In commercial, utilizing the income capitalization method that you get on appraise, uh, appraisals, I've been able to push properties one point seven million dollars within twelve months based upon adding value and adding value by adding dollars to net operating income. Commercial appraisals are like evaluating a business, all right? They really don't care as much about what the what a similar property sold for down the street. What they care about is how much money that business makes. And the money, the biz, the but the income that is evaluated is what is called the net operating income. So what you have a your rents minus your operating expenses. This is before your more, you know, your mortgage expense, right? This is the operating expenses. At the bottom of that, when you subtract out the operating expenses, that is your net operating income. Appraisers will use a certain multiple of that net operating income based upon where that property is, the class of property, what you know, what condition the property is in, of what's called the income capitalization rate. So a more desirable property in a high growth market or a very, very you know, first tier market, like let's say New York City or Los Angeles, is going to have a lower capitalization rate, which means that an investor is willing to, or the market is willing to pay more per dollar for net operating income than let's say Rochester, New York, which is a tertiary rush belt market where my portfolio is, all right? The allowed ownership type, and also just an example on this, right? So this is how 
I was able to, I bought a high rise uh, commercial skyscraper a couple years ago. It was 50% occupied. I bought it for a million and a half dollars. I brought it from 50% occupied up to 80% occupied. And I was able to push that value of that property from 1.5 million to $3.25 million within 12 months, all right, by increasing the net, net operating income up. Thirdly, allowed ownership type. When you are dealing with residential, you are, they require you to get the mortgage in the name of your natural person, right? So my name is Matt Druin, for instance. I have to get the mortgage in my own personal name. That actually, that loan that I get on that investment property, even though that's a business asset, I have to ha carry that loan on my credit report with the credit reporting agencies, right? So I carry that debt. It's like basically like public knowledge amongst the banks. So if you're buying two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars residential deals, you're putting and you're scaling that portfolio, you are putting massive amounts of debt on your personal credit report. With commercial financing, you are able to put the debt in the name of your limited liability company or LLC, okay? And the advantage of this is one, is that it, that debt does not show up on your personal credit report. Now, 99% of the time, if you're buying between 1 million to or even $500,000 to a million dollar deals, or even $5 million or $10 million deals, you're typically going to have a contingent liability, meaning a personal guarantee that you're going to have to have on that property. Okay. So you're going to have to guarantee the debt, but it's not going to show in your personal credit report. All right. Which is great when you're looking to finance, like let's say a home purchase for yourself or a, a, a new car, right. Or a new lease on a car and that sort of thing. So you can drastically destroy your credit score if you were financing investment properties utilizing residential mortgages, all right? This is the scary part of commercial, the term, all right? So typically we're used to, and, and this is where I got caught up, I underwrote properties, uh, commercial properties on 30-year amortizations, and uh, I shouldn't say term here, I should say amortization. Amortization. I was used to having a 30-year amortization, and uh, actually, no, that's right, it is term. A 30-year term, so I'd get fixed rate debt for 30 years, and I would have no balloon payments. This is, was the scary part about commercial when I first got into it is that I would have it, it would have a five year term instead of a uh, of a thirty year term, max sometimes ten year term, and uh, then you have a balloon payment for the entire principal balance that's due once the balloon or term comes up. All right. What was super scary to me was like, okay, how am I going to pay all that off? All right. What I didn't know is that commercial investors are in the business of adding value and refinancing their properties every five to seven years anyway. So refinancing properties, getting new debt on those properties, and then pulling cash out of those properties to expand their balance sheet over the growth of their business. So this is a little bit of a scary part, but it's no big, de it's no big deal, all right? But just something you want to be aware of that typically when you get term sheets out there with commercial lenders, they're not going to have a 30-year term like they do with residential, which you're used to, all right? The interest rate, all right? So we're used to on residential investment properties, one through four units is having a fixed rate for 30 years, all right? On commercial, it's fixed and then variable for, you know, for five to 10 years, okay? So you may have it fixed for five years, you may have it fixed for three years, and then the interest rate will float based upon some type of index or margin, whether it's, you know, prime or whether it's 10-year treasury. All the banks are different in terms of what their actual benchmark is, but just something you wanna be aware, aware of. This is not a big deal for me because like I said, again, like I'm re we're refinancing our properties every five to seven years. So if we get a rate reset and it's higher than we had anticipated, we're buying our deals right, okay? We're buying our deals for the right price, getting a good basis. So, and we're also underwriting conservatively to account for an increase in annual debt service costs. So this is just something to be aware of, right? So don't go in thinking that you, you know, you're gonna be able to, you know, refinance after five years and have a, you know, and have, keep it at the same interest rate. Sometimes the interest rates would be higher. All right. The other thing with the underwriting criteria in terms of there's tons of different underwriting criteria for residential commercial, but the uh, main ones, the most important ones on residential income properties is debt to income ratio. So when you are financing residential properties, residential income properties, you are adding that debt they're using to finance it on your personal credit report and therefore influencing your debt to income ratio. So this can really affect your ability to scale when you are looking to buy, you know, one property this year and another property in 6 months and another property in 6 months after that. Typically when you bring when you go back to buy another deal, 
then you are and you don't ha have a tax return you don't have a tax return on that property then the bank is going to look at okay well you just added $200,000 worth of debt to your balance sheet and we don't have 2 years worth of tax returns based upon the property you just bought do you have w2 income that supports this you know this additional debt onto there so looking more you at your debt to income ratio and this is what can really hamstring your ability to scale your portfolio using residential residential financing okay banks on commercial are more concerned with what's called debt service coverage ratio or debt or dscr the bank actually requires you to make money on the properties okay they're not going to typically not going to be okay with you just breaking even all right so they want you to make uh, a certain amount of margin above what your annual debt service is typically most community banks right now are between anywhere between 1.2 to 1.25 uh, debt service coverage ratio meaning in simple terms that they want to see 20 percent to 25 percent of margin up on top of what your actual break-even point is all right so the other thing to take in consideration with this is that a lot of these loans with community banks commercial commercial properties have what's called a DSCR covenant or debt service coverage ratio covenant, meaning that when you re you have to report to them each year, give them tax returns each year. Once you get above a certain credit re credit relationship level with them in terms of total loans that you have with that bank, they have to give them tax returns and you have to give them uh, schedule E's for your investment properties. So they're going to look closely at what the debt service coverage ratio was on the properties that they have loans on. And they will, you know, they can uh, put you in violation of that covenant if you are not maintaining the debt service coverage ratio that is required by your loan documentations. What is the worst case scenario in that regard? There's a lot of times, a lot of years where we don't make DSCR on our, with our loan covenants, right? Especially on properties, we're looking to stabilize them. You know, we're putting a ton of money into the properties. And then also we're, you know, doing hard turns on apartment units while we're holding it and expensing those instead of capitalizing those items. We can get debt service coverage ratios that are one-to-one. -one. The us most usual recourse for that with your bank is that they are going to, they're going to decrease your sort of relationship rating with that, with that bank and might be less apt to be aggressive with offering you loan terms in the future, okay? Hopefully you have more than one relationship out there if that happens. So that if you're looking to finance or refinance a deal, you can switch, you can switch lenders or diversify your lender relationship stack, right? With residential on loan to values, you're going to see 90% plus, all right, LTV on like, let's say a second home, all right, that you're looking to buy as a vacation property, but actually just really rent it out. So it's an Airbnb or a long-term rental. Usually with, with Fannie Freddie type of uh, uh, conventional income property loans, 80% max is usually going to be what you're going to see out there. All right. It's very similar with commercial. It's going to be anywhere between 75 to 80%, but I've gotten term sheets lately from lenders that will only go up to 70% loan to value. Okay. So this is not, and here's the thing is that, and this leads to my next, next point here with, with the underwriting criteria is that these banks are not all the same with commercial. Every bank is absolutely different in terms of what their credit risks or their credit appetite is and what type of appetite risks they do have. So you may call five different banks that you work with, and then you know, you're gonna get to, you know, a few different types of LTVs that they offer, okay? So don't give up, right? So if you call one bank and they give you 70% LTV max, don't take that as the word of God that that's going to be what all banks are willing to do, right? So you're going to have to do some, put some work into getting other term sheets out there for your deal, whether it's an acquisition or a refinance, all right? Underwriting criteria, super rigid with conventional residential investment property loans, okay? These, these underwriting criteria are basically set by the federal government because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are what's called GSEs or government-sponsored enterprises. And so... There is a lot of uh, a lot of like red tape, and their their underwriting criteria is very very rigid in terms of what they allow for debt to income ratio, all that stuff. Okay. On the converse, with con commercial financing, there's they're more relationship oriented, right? So if you have a deposit relationship with them, if you have a, a couple of investment property loans with them already, then uh, they can be you know more willing to flex on their underwriting criteria and make policy exceptions than conventional. 
And this has worked really, really well in my favor before where I had a, a community bank lender. There was a investment property that was a smoking hot deal that I was looking to acquire. The original term sheet that they offered me was, it was you know, it wasn't ideal, right? I was super close in terms of the numbers on, you know, what I was offering and what the seller's bottom line was, where they were digging their heels in on the price. So uh, I called my bank up. I was like, listen, this is a killer deal. You and I know it. The only way I can make this work is that you can get, you know, if you give me an 80% loan to value and a 25 year amortization on the deal, right? They made a policy exception and I got that deal through. That's the advantage with, com you know, working commercial, commercial mortgages through community banks and regional banks, right? So decision workflow. What this means is when you are dealing with residential, typically you might be dealing with like, let's say a mortgage bank or a, a national bank that does, that does mortgages for investment properties, whether that's Chase Bank or Wells Fargo or Bank of America or whatever. The decision workflow really is like within, you know, smaller departments. All right. So they have like smaller underwriting, underwriting. And as long as that deal fits within the box, then that loan will typically get funded. All right. With commercial financing, it's more of a hierarchical, hierarchical decision making workflow process, meaning that your loan officer will look at the deal, put it through their own uh, credit department and approve that loan. Right. Just because they approve that loan doesn't mean it's actually approved. Sometimes what they actually have to do is they have to bring that to what's called loan committee. So they'll have to present that loan to a room full of other loan officers at that bank or community bank. And their job is to shoot holes in that presentation in terms of, you know, hey, you know, did you account for this risk? Did you account for that risk? We see that this borrower has this, that, and the other thing in terms of, you know, on their tax, on their tax return and that sort of thing. So Sometimes it can, you know, if the loan is big enough relative to the size of that bank, they can actually go up, you know, even up more, you know, more above loan committee to like, let's say vice president level that they have to sign off on it, right? Or even a board, you know, a board approval, okay? So this is kind of a key difference on there. So it is based upon the loan size. Sometimes like there's small community banks I work with where if the loan officer approves it and it gets through cr through their credit an analysis credit analysts department, then they have the ability to sign off on that loan and approve it and give me a commitment letter. All right, so I'm going to go in further detail on this, on how to right size the bank to your actual deals in terms of the tra trajectory you're looking to go later on in this training. All right, capital sources allowed. This is a big game changer too, with conventional mortgage financing from income property. They really want to see 100% of that down payment and closing costs coming from your checking account or savings account or from like your liquid assets. The, the banks, when you're going through underwriting, if you bought a house before in the past, like they don't care so much where, as to where your, where your cash is going from an, exp, an expense standpoint, but they're going to get super scrutinizing over like what deposits are coming into your bank account, right? So Typically, if you get an automatic paycheck or ACH uh, through through you know through your to your bank account, they're not going to be you know so concerned with that. But if they start seeing like a two thousand dollar deposit or a five thousand dollar deposit that's into your checking account, you're going to have to have a letter that explains where that money came from, right? Because they want the money to be coming from you. They don't want it to be coming from some loan shark or you borrowing the money to do that. The advantage to commercial is they're much more flexible in terms of where that down payment capital is coming from, right? So. They're not as scrutinizing. I bought properties before where I borrowed 100% of the money from my investors and I didn't put any of my own money into the deal. Okay. And they did all they cared about was does the deal meet DSCR, debt service coverage ratio? Does the deal appraise for what they're purchasing it for? Right. So we have an equity, you know, equity position in there. We have a piece of collateral that, that's protected by that equity position. Okay. Another huge difference that was a learning, you know, learning curve for me with residential versus commercial financing is prepayment penalties. So with conventional mortgages, no prepayment payment penalty. You can pay it off or refinance it at any point in time. You can sell that property, whatever. There's no prepayment penalty. Prepayment penalties with community banks are something that you know they are holding these loans on their actual balance sheet, meaning that if the loan gets paid off, they have to redeploy that capital because remember. The liabilities that banks have are actually depositors, right? So they have to take the money that you put into checking and savings and then lend it out. So if they get a prepayment back back on that before the loan term was up, then that means they have to redeploy that capital, that that 
that capital takes time to redeploy in terms of a new loan, and therefore that's you know kind of deleterious to the bank you know to the bank's oper you know operations, right? So so yeah, so that's a big one there. Super slick trick. Credit unions do not can and cannot charge prepayment penalties. All right. So where this comes into consider comes into importance here is when you are looking to buy a property like a commercial office building or a small apartment building, let's say a 10-unit apartment building. You're going to put a ton of money into the property. You're going to push rents up. You're going to push net operating income up. And then you're going to refinance the property. And when you go to shop around refinance rates, you know, may find another lender that is better than the current lender that you currently have. And so you may have to factor in a, you know, either a one, two, three percent, or even sometimes five percent prepayment penalty in what the loan balance is in that property. Okay. If you're doing a sort of a, you know, a two-year value add business plan with a commercial deal where you're looking to rapidly increase its value, you might want to finance that acquisition with an actual credit union as opposed to a regular community for-profit bank. Okay. Because then you don't have a prepayment penalty. So there's another big thing that was a, a big change for me is the, the time of rate lock with commercial properties, okay? Residential, right when you submit your mortgage application, you you lock in, right? You lock in your interest rate until closing. What's nerve wracking about commercial is that that interest rate will typically float up until 72 hours re, uh, before closing, and then you'll lock in 72 hours before closing. So if we have a you know Federal Reserve that hiked interest rates every session over a one-year period and interest rates doubled or even tripled in some cases, then that can change the complexion of your deal. Okay. So a little bit, you know, nerve wracking. Not all banks are like this. There will be some that especially smaller, more nimbler banks can do a, a, a rate lock at mortgage application or even at the, when you get a commitment letter, which we'll go into that in a future training in terms of what the order of operations is after you get a term sheet and a deal under contract, but that is something that is that is something to take in, take into consideration. Sometimes, if you are getting a loan big enough, you may actually be able to buy a actually buy a rate cap on the deal to lock it in before closing. This does cost some money, though. You want to ask that question: Are you able? Are we able to to rate lock before before seventy two hours of closing? Okay. Seasoning requirements. What that means is, how long do you have to own a property? Or an investment property before you refinance it, okay, and put new debt on it. Typically, with conventional, they require they require you to have owned that property for six months or even a year, right? So, if you bought a property, let's say with hard money, and you have a six month term on that property to buy it, rehab it, and then refinance it, they might have a seasoning requirement with uh, conventional mortgages, all right, meaning that they will not put financing the property until you've owned it for six months to a year, all right. That can be a that can definitely be a you know destroy your business plan. All right. Community banks never had a community bank that had a seasoning requirement, right? I could buy a property and then three months, you know, with a hard money loan, a private uh, private loan, and then refinance that property three months later, no questions asked. As long as it meets appra uh, appraisal, then we're all good to go. All right. Secondary financing. Conventional, typically no, right? Secondary financing, meaning do they allow a second mortgage on the property? Do they uh, allow the seller to hold the second mortgage on the property? typically not in conventional mortgages, okay? The great thing about commercial financing is that they will allow secondary financing as long as that second lien holder, second mortgage holder is, is agreeing to subordinate their debt to the bank's debt, okay? Meaning that the bank get pay, gets paid first and then the second lien holder, which would be the second mor mortgage holder, all right? I've been able to do killer deals recently. I, I'm selling a portfolio of 17 units I bought back a long time ago to a buyer. My asking price was 1.8. Um, his uh, best price was 1.7. I wasn't willing to go below 1.8 because I was selling the deal off market. So we were able to bridge the gap by me agreeing to take back a $100,000 second position mortgage and the bank was completely fine with it. This allowed him to decrease his closing costs and we put together a creative, creative financing deal through that. Wouldn't have been possible with, with residential, okay? Seller credits, conventional will allow up to a max of typically 3%, max 6% based upon what type of loan product. Seller credits, I mean, I've had uh, seller credits that are you know 10% of the total deal amount on commercial and the bank has been okay with it. As long as the deal makes sense and as long as typically the, you know, the, the bank knew I had some sort of skin in the game, skin in the game or somebody's skin in the game, the acquisition, right? So I can negotiate a repair credit or I can negotiate the deal right up front. 
all right, you want 1.8, I'm willing to pay you 1.8 if you give me a $100,000 credit at closing, or I'm willing to wait, I'm willing to pay 1.9 if you give me a $100,000 credit at closing, okay? I put deals together like that. Big thing on residential is there's typically no environmental due diligence. On commercial, five units plus, okay? Five units plus or anything that has a commercial component to it, bank is typically going to want what's called environmental due diligence. It's basically a title report on the property. It's also called a phase one or a transaction screen. This is like a title report on the property to see what the actual history of the property is to see if there's any type of uses that may have had an adverse impact or environmental impacts in those properties that would affect, let's say, the quality of health of people that use the building, right? Whether it's commercial or live in the building, whether it's residential, multifamily. So that being said, when you are buying a commercial property, always get environmental due diligence, even if you don't have to, if you're getting a you know seller financing on the front end and you're looking to refinance it and place it with a bank, always get environmental due diligence at the bare minimum of a transaction screen on that property. And the transaction screen is basically like is a, is a less expensive phase one environmental, which is essentially a title report. Usually results, it requires a site inspection of the property by a environmental consultant, all right? So this is one big cap, you know, big caveat, big change that was for me because I was I bought I bought commercial properties and early in my career when I transitioned to commercial with hard money loans, with seller financing, I didn't do this the environmental due diligence because I didn't have a bank requiring me to do the environmental and then I got spanked in the back end when I went to refinance that property, okay? Personal guarantees typically with with a residential property, anybody that's on the deed is typically going to need to to be a personal guarantor on the mortgage, have that mortgage be on their credit rep, uh, credit report. Typically, the borrowers are going to be jointly and, and jointly and severably liable. All right, so if one screws up, they both screw up. And with a commercial, you can bring on minority partners. For instance, I structured a lot of transactions like this where I'll have my minority partners bring 100% of the cash to the uh, the deal. In exchange, I'll give them a 19% membership interest in the in the deal. I'll pay them a fixed percent of interest while their while their money is in the deal, and then I get to buy them out when I refinance the property. As long as they're below 19%, at least in the case of the banks that I work with, then that bank will not require a personal guarantee by that uh, by that by that member. All right. Once you get above 19%, they'll typically require a personal guarantee, require you to have a pers uh, personal financial statement, and really open up the kimono. Right. So. High net, high net worth individuals, investors that we deal with, typically they're only uh, they're only willing to risk the capital they put into the deal. They don't want to be a, a liable for above and beyond that. Okay. So, lastly, net worth requirements typically in residential. I guess is a good thing for residential. They don't have really net worth requirements. They're underwriting you as your ability to produce income as a W two employee. They don't really care about the property. They care about the property from a loan to value standpoint, but they don't really require you to have a net worth requirement. So you can buy a five hundred thousand dollar investment property, get a four hundred thousand dollar loan on it, and you could have a net worth of a hundred thousand dollars, and they really don't care. Not the case with commercial. All right. Sometimes net worth can actually be a require you know requirement to, that's a, equivalent to the loan amount. All right. And I'm going going to go first in this in terms of what the home what your homework is going to be in terms of if you're looking to educate yourself more about commercial financing in terms of your workarounds around that. So if you're looking to buy a million dollar property and put an $800,000 loan on it, but you don't have an $800,000 net worth, like a lot of people like a lot of people do, what type of workarounds are available around that, okay? So lead me to my first, uh, uh, my first homework, right? All right, so with the finding local banks that are right-sized for your intermediate term goals, meaning how much property or how much you're looking to scale your, your portfolio over the next two to three years, all right? I typically want to find a bank that is going to be, that I can work with and establish that relationship with and grow that relationship over that two to three year period, all right? So if I'm looking to acquire $5 million worth of property over three years, I want to find a lender that has the capacity to work with me and grow that relationship through that sort of that phase of my growth on that, right? So the best way to find this out is, you know, if you're not in local Facebook groups, if you don't have a Facebook account, get a Facebook account, just create a dummy, you know, dummy account, put a picture of yourself up on there and that sort of thing, and join some local Facebook groups that are, that have real estate investors that live in those Facebook groups, and then ask them about, you know, what's the best commercial, you know, what's the best few commercial lenders are local to the Rochester area out there. References are going to, going to be your friend. I hate, you know, I, I hate that this is sort of like trite, like, you know, ask for referrals and that sort of thing, but this is really the best way to do it. All right. So 
if you are don't have a, a Facebook account, and you have no even Facebook group in, 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 in you know, your area and that sort of thing, I doubt that this is the case. You know, Google search banks in your town, right? So community banks, Rochester, New York, all right? And then what I like to do is I like to go to the actual website itself. So I'm actually going to share my screen again. So let's see, we're gonna go to, um, let's think of a random town. Let's talk about uh, uh, community banks in Watertown, New York. Okay, super random place, all right? And so I'm gonna go to maps. And then, all right, so the banks I'm actually going to avoid are going to be the sponsored ones here. Okay, because you can see that these are sponsored results for, for banks in Watertown, all right? So I'm gonna want to uh, avoid those ones probably. You know, especially ones you know that are national or regional outfits. National and regional banks are not gonna be your friend while you're going through, you know, going through this. So right here we see a, let's see, AmeriQ Credit Union. Okay, all right, so it is sponsored, but let's check it out. Oh, we can go right to the website. All right, cool. So I'm gonna share this tab here. And what I'm gonna look for is I'm gonna look for, let's say I'm gonna go to the business tab and I'm going to go to business equipment loans. All right, services and tools, borrow. Let me see here. So sometimes if you don't see actual like business mortgages or anything like that, then typically it's gonna be something where it's probably not gonna be a bank that does commercial, commercial lending. But if they have business lending here, let's just try to go to this, all right? Okay. Oh, credit cards and real estate. All right. Don't sleep on this, right? So this is where to see real estate, real estate mortgage. All right. All right, cool. So we're going to see this. What I'm going to look at next is I'm going to look at the locations. All right. To establish, to evaluate how big this bank actually is. Okay. So I'm going to go down through here. And typically I'm going to look at, all right. So this looks like a regional bank here. I'm going to zoom out. Looks like it might be, you know, they got a fair amount of branches here. This might be a bank that you can actually work, you know, work with over your first like five years or so. All right. So that's how I found the, find the banks. I contact their uh, commercial lending departments and start the conversation there. All right. So I'm actually going to go to, so that's how to find the banks, right? So once you develop that list, the referrals and also doing your own research, then re you know, reach out to those right size lenders and set up meeting, meetings to talk about their products and ask these questions, okay? This is your homework in terms of these questions, okay? And let me back up a second. The reason why you want to establish meetings is because the last thing you wanna do is find a deal, all right? So you found this uh, Amera CU credit union, right? And you just know, okay, I got, I, there's a, they got some stuff here, okay? I, can, I, can, I might be able to work with them, but I don't know for sure. I don't know what type of products they have and that sort of thing, but I, I, but I know I got somebody I can contact. Then you go to call them, and then you quickly learn that you get the runaround in terms of who's responsible for what. You get in touch with the actual right loan officer, and by the way, you know the the deal space works pretty fast. Okay, it's not going to work this slow in terms of you being able to wade through this whole thing, finding the right contact, and then when they pick up the phone and get a phone call from you, they're not going to know you from Adam. All right, and also remember that loan officer, depending upon how big it is. That bank right there, AmeriQ Federal Credit Union, probably has a loan committee, right? So this, this loan officer doesn't know you, never met you before, never heard of you, and now you're going to bring them a deal, even if they want to do the deal, and they're going to have to submit this term, sh you know, you know, get a go in front of a loan committee, and go in front of a loan committee, and they're going to be basically say, like, hey, I got a phone call from this guy. I don't really know him, but it uh, looks like he's got a decent deal. It's just not the position you want to be in, right? With somebody advocating for your deal, right? So reach out to them, set up a face-to-face -face meeting at whatever's convenient for them, whether it's out for coffee, whether it's out for lunch, whether it's in their, you know, in their branch where you can meet with them and talk to them, right? So ask these questions, right? What types of asset classes do you not lend on, all right? How are loan decisions made? This is the this question you want to be is like, okay, how, you know, what, what do you have in terms of deal size that you're able to uh, approve up to before it has to go to loan committee, all right? Also ask these questions establishes your credibility in terms of you know what you're talking about and not that you're, you know, this sort of noob, right? Because this person, because they're sort of like co-signing on your loan when, if they fund it, right? So they have, a because the bank is going to hold it on their balance sheet. So if they don't do their due diligence, and they don't feel good about the loan, then, and not about you as, an, as a credible operator that knows your stuff, 
then uh, this can greatly influence your ability to get funding on either acquisitions or refinancings, right? Additionally, what is the max relationship limit with your bank? Okay, so some of these some of these banks will allow, you know, especially the small ones will only have a relationship limit up to 1.5 million. If you're looking to scale up to $5 million portfolio or you're looking to buy your first property for a million and a half, you know, you're going to be tapped out with one deal, right? I want to have to, I want to make sure that there's some runway in growing that relationship. Next question is what are your standard terms? What types of terms have you negotiated in the, have you negotiated in the past, right? So there's standard terms. And then you also want to ask like what types of ones have they negotiated in the past? Okay. So like made policy exceptions on. So if I, you know, have another term sheet with another, another bank, you know, are you willing to, you know, have you ever done an interest only, you know, interest only period before, especially if it's a property that has a lot of, you know, deferred maintenance that I need to come in and put a ton of money into and that sort of thing. Follow up question to that is how many people do you have on your team? So the reason why I like to know that is some of these small banks, especially super small ones, they don't have a lot of teams like the loan officer does everything. They do, they do credit analysis. They do, app, you know, app intake application. They do compliance with the covenants that are on, you know, all the loans that are in their portfolio. So I want to know that like, all right, this bank actually has like a, you know, this loan officer has a certain amount of have backup and that sort of thing and team that backs them up and therefore my business up as well. Um, what information do you need from me in order to get a term sheet? This is another question, right? Because sometimes they just need a, a rent roll and pro forma, okay? Rent roll and pro forma to get a term sheet, all right? Sometimes to get a term sheet, they're going to want to see, you know, two years worth of tax returns on a, on a property. You want to be armed with this so you know what to ask for on the front end when you're looking at commercial real estate deals. What do you typically charge for a commitment fee is another question, all right? When you get a commitment letter, this is different than residential. When you get a commitment letter and you sign that commitment letter, the bank is typically want, going to want to collect a commitment fee from you at that point in time, along with the payment for an appraisal, along with the payment for environmental and that sort of thing. So, so sometimes this commitment fee can range from a, a quarter of a percent to half percent to all the way up to 1% that you have to pay, pay. So just in terms of projecting what type of cash you're going to need between contract and closing, even if you're raising 100% of the, cap, the capital for the deal, which I, you know, which I teach is, you know, ooh, up ma, use other people's money always. You want to make sure that you have enough cash in your own balance sheet to get through this, either cash or credit facilities to get you through this through this process from commitment letter to closing. What types of borrower criteria do you typically have? All right, this is important in terms of like what are your sticking points, like what are your hot like what are your hot button issues on on properties do you lend do you lend on? Okay, every bank is going to be different based upon what their based upon what their risk appetite is. Are there any hard and fast rules, or are you flexible? Okay. So, you know, what are those sort of sticking points again, you know, that some things that might be negotiable that you might be able to work through? What is just stuff like that might be like, you know, examples of non-negotiable types of stuff. Okay. So after going through these interviews, then you can find any property, commercial property. This could be something you find a loop net, a deal you're not even interested in and contacting the broker and then underwriting and underwriting that investment property, right? And then contact one of those lenders to get what's called a term sheet. This is essentially the pre-approval letter of the commercial real estate business, okay? And then make sure that the property is significantly occupied, all right? Most community banks are not going to finance properties that are 100% vacant or like, let's say 30% occupied and that sort of thing. So this is another question you're gonna wanna ask is like, you know, what are like what type of occupancies do you need to see on deals you finance, all right? Some of them might be okay with 50 percent as long as you're buying at a price that makes that makes DSCR that makes the DSCR loan covenant. Some of them it, they don't care how good of a deal you're getting on it. If they're if the deal is fifty percent occupied, we just won't do the deal, regardless if you're stealing it and it's a smoking hot deal. So once you get a term sheet on that property, you can underwrite that property with what that proposed financing and calculate closing you know closing costs and and et cetera. Okay. So this is kind of kind of where it's it's easier when you have an actual example property that you can uh, that you kind of riff on with your loan officer, okay? Rather than thinking about things in some sort of theoretical way. When you do find a property you're you know super interested in, request a term sheet from those three lenders in that property, okay? Underwrite the property and then submit an offer and attach that the worst term sheet with that offer, okay? This is what I use as a as a, like a little like slick trick negotiation tactic in terms of I'm buying this for income purposes. This is what my bank is willing to do. 
I need this type of, you know, this type of return, this type of return. So I'd love to be able to pay you more for this deal, but I can't based upon what type of financing I can get, right? So if I get a counter offer and my numbers are really co close, then I can go back and underwrite based upon one of those better term sheets and see if I want to do the deal or not, right? It depends upon the opportunity and how good of an uh, and who how to how great of an opportunity it might be, all right? If you get your offer accepted and then you uh, and then you know if let's say you get your offer accepted and you can actually you know go through and then negotiate the best terms for the deal to sweeten the pot. So at this point in time, what I'll do is I'll take the the best term sheet I've gotten, I'll shop it around to the other lenders who gave me term sheets like, hey, listen, I want to build a relationship with you. I'm looking to acquire, you know, a few deals in the next couple of years, but you know, are you able to meet or beat this this deal that I have on the table here? Here's a term sheet. You need to have a term sheet because the bank is not going to get not going to negotiate against itself. All right. So if you have a term sheet, it's like, hey, I got this from a competitor. It's just like one of those things where you go to, you know, you know, you go to Walmart or something like that, where like, you know, you know, where they're rolling back prices, right? And you bring in a competitor's ad. All right. You can't just say, well, Kmart is selling a, a bag of topsoil for five bucks and you are want six bucks for yours. So well, show me the ad. Show me the ad worth five bucks. Okay. This is the same type of thing. So then they can actually have this take this documentation, escalate it up to their superior, or maybe they sometimes have discretion themselves in terms of their scorecard and in terms of if they can do the deal with you or not, or sweeten the pot. Okay. So then what I do is then I'll get the best term sheet possible and then I will I'll, you know, I'll actually, you know, close, you know, I'll close a deal with that with that bank and look to, you know, grow that relationship with them. Okay. This is kind of a little bit outside the scope of this training, but if you do have high equity, low return on equity investments, um, what I would do is I would actually use this, which you've learned from this training, to refinance those properties and pull, ca and pull cash out, all right? The reason being is because when you're looking to swim upstream into larger and larger commercial real estate deals, the banks are going to get more and more scrutinizing on your actual balance sheet, right? So that being said, I'm actually going to show you a recent client, a recent client of mine, for instance, on what they on what they did, right? So they had a when I onboarded them, we go through this customized continuous balance sheet optimization method to get you long term, you know, get your uh, balance sheet positioned in the most optimal way for long term exponential growth. Okay, so this is a great opportunity to actually build a relationship with one of these lenders by actually refinancing a property you've already done. And now we've, I know we've been talking about commercial financing today, but if you have a portfolio of properties, like let's say that's like a two family and a three family and a four family property, you can actually get commercial financing on those deals, get those loans out of your personal, uh, off your personal credit report, put it, you know, basically put it in your LLC name, and then you can actually do your first commercial finance deal with a bank. What a great way to build a relationship with them to actually do some business with them and then use that cash on your balance sheet to uh to you know strengthen yourself as a personal guarantor all right so that way when you raise 100% of the capital from outside investors the bank is still going to look at your own personal balance sheet to make sure you have a good amount of dry powder on your balance sheet when they're growing with you okay so in the next video i'm going to explain a through z and how to get the deal from accepted offer all the way to closing i'm going to go through the actual mechanical processes in terms of from contract to closing and working with the bank on that and, and the types of documents that you'll you'll be required to, to have. So, and then if you want my customized insight and recommendations on what you can do right now to get positioned to take your portfolio to the moon and replace your income 10 times faster than I did, took me 11 years to replace my income buying small multifamily, took me one year to replace my wife's income with my first commercial deal with none of my own money, all right? And added a $500,000 share net worth, right? That was the last time I looked back on residential, okay? And if you're looking to learn how you can do that specifically and how I might be able to help you, definitely check the description below and you can book in a free one-hour consult. Completely non, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a, you know, a high pressure salesperson, and that's, that sort of thing. If I have a, if I, if what I have to offer is a good fit, then great, we can talk about working together. If it's not, then at the very least, I'll give you a lot of value, a lot of action and insight in terms of what your next steps might be in terms of your journey into commercial real estate and bigger deals, okay? And then if you're not quite ready to speak with me, I have a free course with case studies on how I replace my wife's income, specifically how I did that deal 
and also several others that I've that I've done and go into great detail with a high degree of specificity where you can pull out those actionable items that you can do right now. So that being said, this is the end of the, the training. Cheers. Check out my other uh, content content in on my YouTube channel and be sure to subscribe. I'm putting out these trainings on the regular and I look forward to adding value to you and your journey to commercial from residential.